The historian Nachman Ben Yehuda wrote a seminal book in 2013 titled Atrocity, Deviance, and Submarine Warfare, Norms and Practices During the World Wars. The book features some of the worst war crimes perpetuated during both world wars. Ben Yehuda believes that submarines were the leading war machines that allowed for the commission of war crimes. In his own words, in the early 20th century, the diesel-electric submarine made possible a new type of unrestricted naval warfare. Such brutal practices as targeting passenger, cargo, and hospital ships not only violated previous international agreements, they were targeted explicitly at civilians. A deviant form of warfare quickly became the norm. The U-boats were an integral part of the Imperial German war machine during the latter part of World War I. They were a formidable addition to the German Imperial Navy, or Kaiserliche Marine. The U-boat designated as U-55 was launched on August 2, 1916, entering into service on November 15, 1916. That was already more than two years into the war. To complicate matters, it should be noted that the designation U-55 was given to other U-boat submarines during both the First and Second World Wars. The focus here will be on the U-55 that committed war crimes on a scale few other naval vessels matched during the First World War. The Belgian Prince was a British merchant ship on a voyage between Liverpool, England, and Newport News in the United States. It was torpedoed by U-55 on the night of July 31, 1917. The ship was struck about 175 miles off the west coast of Ireland. According to the eyewitness account of one of the survivors of the sinking, the torpedo struck at roughly 7.50 p.m. The ship quickly took on water and so the survivors on board the Belgian Prince entered lifeboats. To their horror, the men found themselves being fired at by the submarine as they tried to clamber into the lifeboats. All the communication equipment on board the merchant ship was destroyed, so there wasn't even time for Captain Harry Hassan to radio for help. The Germans ordered the lifeboats to approach the submarine and for all the merchant sailors to stand on its deck. The men were then ordered by the Germans to take off their life jackets and overcoats and throw them on the deck of the submarine. The German submariners came along to search the merchant seamen while kicking and throwing most of the life jackets into the sea. It was then that the German sailors were themselves ordered to hack the lifeboats with axes. The submarine then slowly moved forward for about two and a half miles with the bewildered merchant seamen still on its deck. Suddenly, the submarine descended into the depths of the cold North Atlantic waters, dragging the crew of the Belgian Prince down with it. Only about a dozen of the crew were able to break the surface and survive the initial descent. However, most of them died during the night due to their injuries or hypothermia. More horror ensued when the Belgian Prince itself, which was still afloat, blew up after daybreak. Turns out there was a German submarine that surfaced just after the ship blew up, very possibly to come back and destroy the British merchant ship. Undoubtedly, the intention must have also been to kill any survivors who may have been on or near the ship when it exploded. In fact, two of the surviving crew were so close to the Belgian Prince when it got blown up that they almost died in the explosion. Just three of the crew of the Belgian Prince were still alive in the water when picked up by a British patrol boat during August 1st. The survivors were then taken to Londonderry in Northern Ireland, where they could recount the horrors of what they'd endured that day. One of the survivors was an American called Willie Snell, who was the ship's second cook. He would later testify how he had concealed a life belt, which he saw the German U-boat commander had failed to notice when kicking life belts over the deck of the U-boat. Even at the height of a world war that was ravaging Europe, the events of the Belgian Prince were considered especially vicious. The British newspapers had a field day with emotional phrases such as a crime unparalleled for fiendish cruelty and a cold-blooded murder splashed across headlines and copious lines of copy. The minutes of a meeting held by the war cabinet of British Prime Minister David Lloyd George referred to the Belgian Prince murders as an outrage. Ian Wilson, an historian at Bangor University in Wales, has commented that the sinking of the Belgian Prince although an outrage would have still been an excellent propaganda scoop for the British government. The government could keep reminding its British citizens as to just how barbaric and bloodthirsty the Germans, or Huns as they were referred to back then, could actually be. Wilson does add, however, that British forces did things during that war that were just as bad as what U-55 did to the crew of the Belgian Prince on that July night. 
The events of the Belgian Prince sinking may have been the worst atrocity committed by the commander and crew of U-55, but it wasn't the only one. The sinking of the SS Torrington was another serious war crime committed by the U-boat. The SS Torrington was a cargo ship making its way from Italy back to the port of Barrie in Wales. It was scheduled to pick up another haul of cargo to be sent back to Savona in Italy. On the morning of April 8, 1917, the SS Torrington was steaming ahead to lifeboats on the horizon. The people on those boats had just survived the torpedoing of their ship, a steamship named Umvodi, an attack by none other than U-55 itself. Unfortunately, the SS Torrington was hit by a torpedo by U-55, lurking underwater nearby. The ship was hit almost head-on and quickly started tilting to its bow, its propeller completely out of the water. Suddenly, the German submarine appeared on the starboard bow of the SS Torrington. Captain Starkey on board the ship knew he was in trouble, especially since his ship was taking on a lot of water. Although armed with a naval gun, Captain Starkey nevertheless thought it best to surrender to the U-boat. And so he had the ensign for surrender raised. The captain joined 20 of his men in one lifeboat while 15 other crew got into the other lifeboat. Under threat of more gunfire, the Germans forced the lifeboats to row to the submarine. Captain Starkey was dragged down into the sub to be interrogated by its commander, Wilhelm Werner. The British captain was accused of lying about his position on board the SS Torrington and was even accused by the demented Werner of being a pirate. What Captain Starkey didn't realize was that all his men were still on the deck of the U-boat when it submerged into the waters. With that, all the crew of the SS Torrington drowned as the submarine plunged downwards. For 15 days, Starkey remained a prisoner on U-55, unaware that this man had not been allowed to row away but drowned instead in that most despicable manner. He would then be interned as a war prisoner in Germany. It must be stressed that the war crimes committed by U-55 were not unique, nor did they occur in a so-called vacuum. The ferocity of their attacks was courtesy of an official Imperial German military edict that was passed in February of 1917. It was then that the German Admiral Staff was finally able to convince the German Chancellor, Theobald von Bethmann Hallweg, that unrestricted U-boat warfare be allowed. The effect was immediate, with the sinking of naval and merchant ships shooting up to 520,000 tonnage of losses by the end of March and a staggering 860,000 tons by the end of April 2017. Merchant ships were especially targeted by U-boats at the time. The ensuing atrocities committed by U-boats against both military and civilian ships and crewmen were immense. One of the worst war crimes was committed by U-86 under the command of Helmut Patzig on June 27, 1918 when his submarine sank the hospital ship Ellen Dovery Castle. An attack on a hospital ship was itself a major war crime, but it got worse. Patzig then ordered his U-boat to ram lifeboats and shoot at survivors struggling in the water. Only 24 of the 258 crew on board the Landovery Castle survived the onslaught by U-86. And so it's clear that the crimes committed by U-55 were just one of many perpetuated by the infamous U-boat division of World War I. One cannot analyze the war crimes of U-55 without briefly discussing the commander and war criminal of a submarine, namely Wilhelm Werner. The German naval officer wasn't only admired by his admiralty for what he did to the crews of the SS Torrington and the Belgian Prince, he was lauded and awarded for them. Oh, it should also be noted that Werner and his U-55 crew would also sink the British hospital ship Rua, as well as fire upon another hospital ship, the Guildford Castle. The latter ship was fortunate that the torpedo launched by U-55 failed to explode. Werner would hold the prestigious rank of Captain Lieutenant, the equivalent to Lieutenant Commander, by early 1918. He was also awarded the House Order of Hohenzollern, and the Iron Cross first and second class. He would also receive a number of other German medals as well as Bulgarian and Turkish medals from countries allied to Imperial Germany during that war. Germany lost the First World War, of course, and the British were eager to prosecute Werner at the war crimes trials being held in Leipzig in Eastern Germany. However, like so many war criminals later, Werner fled to Brazil, it's believed he worked for a few years in Brazil as both an architect and coffee planter. However, Werner no doubt sensed things were brewing in Weimar Germany, 
and so he returned to his homeland in 1924. He faced trial by a German court in 1926 for war crimes but was acquitted. He soon joined the Nazi party, which was quickly growing in popularity as the economic crisis in the Weimar Republic worsened. He was able to secure a seat in the Reichstag as a Nazi candidate and would then join the paramilitary Schutzstaffel, otherwise known as the infamous and brutal SS. Werner clearly belonged with the murderous thugs of the Nazi party. He would rise to the rank of SS Brigadeführer, or Brigadier General within the Nazi regime. He would then serve on the personal staff of none other than Heinrich Himmler during World War II. He died in May 1945, before the Second World War even ended. Wilhelm Werner was never tried or held legally responsible for the devastating war crimes he'd committed during World War I. U-55, under the command of Wilhelm Werner, committed numerous war crimes in its short time of service. Many men perished due to the barbarity of Werner and his crew. Among them was Neil McDougall Morton, the chief officer aboard the Belgian Prince, and whose body was washed ashore on September 23, 1917, at Quan Ferry, on the island of Luang, off the west coast of Scotland. Morton's mother erected a gravestone at Kilbrandon Old Churchyard that has the following epitaph, he gave his life that we might not starve.